tonight, celebrating Canada's big day. The party turns political on Parliament Hill. We can and we must continue to make our country even better. So how are Canadians really feeling as the election looms? <laughs> Crisis in yeah. Hong Kong as activists stormed the legislature. How a day of peaceful protest ended in violence. She can't believe it. I'm literally living my dream right now. And the Wimbledon rookie who upset Venus Williams, and she's only 15. The teens who are owning the court, including a Canadian. This is The National. Right across the country today, gatherings big and small celebrated all things Canadian. But don't think everyone was out just to have fun. Dotted throughout the crowds were politicians with eyes on the upcoming election, including at the big party in Ottawa. Happy Canada Day! Joyeuse fête du Canada! It was a celebration with all the fixings, a flyover, a stage full of music, even a celebrity appearance or two. Bonjour tout le monde! Hello everybody! Happy Canada, Canada Day! Bonne, Bonne fête, fête Canada! Canada! Thousands packed the lawn of Parliament Hill to celebrate Canada turning 152. No, not a milestone birthday, but this is a big year. With the federal election coming up in October, Canadians have a lot on their minds. A new poll for CBC News found the majority are dealing with a whole lot of anxiety, worried about everything from job security to their grocery bills to climate change. So with the election in mind, politicians weren't just waving the flag, but prepping their, uh, their pitches. Katie Simpson was watching it all from Parliament Hill. The country's biggest birthday party drew Canadians from far and wide. In their best red and white, it was a full showing of true patriot love. Canada Day includes everyone. It makes us feel welcome and we are very happy to be here. Happy birthday, Canada. Though this year's celebration had a noticeable political edge. Canadians have so much to be proud of this year, and I'm not just talking, talking about the rafters. What the Prime Minister wants to talk about four months ahead of the election is the work of his government while appealing to voters for another chance. As of this May, 85 long-term drinking water advisories have been lifted and 825,000 people, including almost 300,000 kids, are no longer living in poverty in Canada. If it sounds like Justin Trudeau was on the campaign trail, he was earlier in the day, deep in conservative territory in suburban Ottawa, supporting his local candidate. Chris is working really hard to change this place red. You know right <laughs> this will be the weekend routine for all federal party leaders until the fall vote. I'm very optimistic about our ability, my ability to connect with voters between now and the election, and then ongoing. Andrew Scheer was careful about who he connected with today. At a rib fest in Vote Rich Toronto, one of three cross-country stops, he was not seen with the increasingly unpopular Conservative Premier Doug Ford. While the NDP's Jugmeet Singh was making his presence known in his BC riding. And let's commit to tackling inequality so that the Canada that we believe in is a Canada where everyone can realize their dreams. Politics and the issues that divide Canadians don't seem top of mind on Parliament Hill. Instead, with many choosing to focus on the one thing uniting the country. Happy Canada Day! In French, Canada! Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So that poll we mentioned earlier shows just what politicians are up against as they try to get voters on side. Canadians have a lot of concerns, and we are exploring them as part of our series On Guard for Me, Uneasy Canadian. And today, the Prime Minister weighed in. That anxiety is real. There's a lot of people struggling to make ends meet, a lot of people worried about the future. My responsibility as a politician, as a leader, is to help allay those fears and put forward solutions. 
Public Square Research and Maru Blue surveyed 4,500 Canadians and found 72% are worried or somewhat worried about the future. Topping the list of reasons why? Cost of living, climate change and health. But new Canadians specifically say they are less worried than the overall population. And Kayla Hounsell shows us they will be watching the campaign closely. Hi, how are you? Mantadar Naji exemplifies the Canadian dream. Originally from Iraq, he came to Canada as a refugee 10 years ago. Now he owns and operates three businesses. We have everything we need here. I mean, we have the, the electricity, it's a safe country, it's, uh, you know, the people, the, that's all opportunities, I think. Naji sponsored his wife and they now have two Canadian-born children. The poll shows that newcomers are generally more optimistic about the future than the rest of the country. They're also more likely to trust the government to do the right thing, and they have a high regard for Justin Trudeau. We love him. <laughs> we love him. We support him. He helped a lot of refugees. Yeah. He brought a lot of refugees. Topping the list of issues new Canadians say are important to them, finding jobs and having previous credentials recognized. The main issue for me now to go back to my profession as a dentist as soon as possible. Isa Al-Hariri is not quite so optimistic. He came to Canada in 2016 and has been studying to meet requirements, but it's a long process. He doesn't have a job. Actually, I used to be very successful in my uh, practice as a dentist. I used to work to, for the Ministry of Health in Syria, help others. Now I feel I am in need. I am under this help. So uh, for me, as uh, I, uh, embarrassing actually. I, Lee Cohen has been practicing immigration law for more than 30 years. He says new Canadians should be watching this election campaign for promises and ideas related to the immigration system. Trudeau brought some light. The light needs to be brighter. And uh, it's a question mark in my mind um, who can shine that light. Cheeseburger combo. No Mantadar Naji is preparing to vote for the first time now that he's a Canadian citizen. According to the poll, new Canadians say they don't know enough about Andrew Scheer and Jagmeet Singh and they think the Green Party is too radical. Naji says he also needs more information but will be watching closely, proud to have the opportunity to have his voice heard. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. To Hong Kong now, where July 1st marks a different kind of milestone, the anniversary of its handover from Britain to China. This year, though, adds some angry protests. That led to an unprecedented scene, protesters smashing their way into the legislature and symbolically taking it over. The CBC's Asia correspondent Sasha Petrosik takes us through the day. Hong Kong's legislature and the area around it was a battle zone today with scenes this former British colony has never witnessed. Protesters laid siege to the centre of government all afternoon, mashing its doors and windows, taunting the riot police inside. They're young and frustrated with a government they insist represents China's interests here, not theirs. We are the future of the Hong Kong citizens and we have to fight for our future freedom. Then they stormed in, taking over the chamber normally dominated by government members closely tied to the Beijing leadership, spraying protest slogans on the wood-panelled walls. As the police withdrew, pro-democracy groups took the seats of power. Half a million others filled the streets of Hong Kong today, more peaceful but no less angry about government proposals that would allow extraditions to China, a law they want scrapped. They're dissatisfied with apologies and promises to reconsider the law from Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam. Protesters demand her resignation and even allies now question her leadership. Around midnight, police finally moved in, using tear gas to clear protesters from the streets around the legislature. And in the halls of government itself, police seemed to face no resistance from the several hundred who'd swept through. Lam herself emerged for a pre-dawn news conference, where she denounced the violence and vandalism. Which really 
saddens a lot of people and shocks a lot of people. But remained as defiant as ever. She offered no concessions, vowing to go after those who attacked the legislature. So uh, this is something that uh, we should seriously condemn. Sasha joins us now from Beijing where it's Tuesday morning. So Sasha, where do things stand today? Well, as they look at these pictures, Hong Kongers are going to be stunned and also with the prospect of protests continuing because neither the government nor the protesters seem to be budging. It also leaves Beijing in quite a quandary. This is the biggest challenge to China's rule since the Tiananmen protests 30 years ago. And uh, its hands are pretty much tied because Hong Kong is a semi-autonomous territory and has to rely on the people there to do the right thing. All right, Sasha, thanks very much. This is not ending anytime soon. My pleasure. As you saw there, Hong Kong's leader, Carrie Lam, is under fire from all sides. She's a lightning rod for protesters. Her popularity is at a record low, and she's feeling immense pressure from Beijing. I think Hong Kong is an inseparable part of the People's Republic of China. Since becoming Hong Kong's chief executive in 2017, Carrie Lam has struggled to shake accusations that she answers more to Beijing than Hong Kongers. For one thing, ordinary residents didn't choose her. Instead, only 1,200 people, or 0.03% of the city's registered voters, are allowed to cast a ballot. The election committee is comprised mostly of elites loyal to Beijing. But to say that uh, I, I am just a puppet, I won this election because of pro-Beijing forces, is sort of uh, uh, a failure to acknowledge what I have done in Hong Kong. As the city faces its most serious challenge since the handover from British rule, Lam is facing her greatest test yet, serving two masters, the people of Hong Kong, millions of whom are upset about that extradition bill, and Beijing which handpicked her as chief executive, competing pressures that could shape the territory for years to come. Here at home, a prominent and provocative political cartoonist has found himself at the center of a debate over censorship. Now, you may know Michael de Adder's name. You have probably seen some of his work. His recent cartoon about Donald Trump and a dad and daughter who drowned on the U.S.-Mexico border was praised on social media and then a shock. The adder was dropped by New Brunswick's main papers. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, he is pretty sure the two are linked. The cartoon is no doubt provocative, depicting Donald Trump more interested in his golf game than a tragedy at the border. The artist shared it online and it went viral. Then... One day, out of the blue, I'm fired. That news went viral too, with other cartoonists, even celebrities, crying censorship. But Michael DeAdder still isn't clear if the Trump cartoon was to blame. The only thing that was different that I had the most viral cartoon I ever drew. And until I get an answer of why I was fired, eh, that's good enough reason for me. Brunswick News denies that DeAdder's contract was cancelled over his latest Trump cartoon, calling it a false narrative, which has emerged carelessly and recklessly on social media. DeAdder says his Trump cartoons were turned away before, an issue cartoonists have faced in the U.S. as well. They were okay with me drawing Trump, but they wanted me to draw him in a more favorable light, and I said I can't do that. Rob Rogers was fired from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette last year after 25 years with the paper. He believes because of his Trump cartoons. It hasn't stopped him. Last week, he did his own interpretation of that photo and Trump. I think that editorial cartooning and satire in general are, are one of the most unique forms of free expression that, that we, can ha we have. When that is under attack, I think it's, it's a sign of an unhealthy democracy. Many in the industry believe there is a bigger shift happening away from provocative political cartoons. The editorial staff is representing ownership or investors or whoever it is. Somewhere along the chain, somebody is saying, we really don't want to be associated with these ideas. And to me, that's a form of censorship. I didn't give a crap what someone told me not to draw. Deatter is back to the drawing board for the other papers he works for, and Trump is still on the table. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. A UN watchdog says Iran has broken its pledge to limit its low-enriched uranium. 
مرحله بعد هم اعلام شده Iran's foreign minister says the move is reversible, but only if the country gets relief from tough sanctions laid out in the international deal it signed in 2015. The U.S. pulled out of that agreement last year, calling it weak. Today, President Trump said what Iran is doing amounts to playing with fire. And a Facebook mail facility in California may have been contaminated with a deadly poison. An item sent through a scanning machine has tested positive for sarin. But more tests are needed to confirm that result. Two people were possibly exposed, but they haven't shown any symptoms. Sarin is a synthetic nerve agent that can kill within minutes. And protesters in Sudan appear determined to return their country to civilian rule. They were back in the streets today despite a weekend of clashes with security forces, which left at least 10 people dead and nearly 200 wounded. Three months ago, many were optimistic when the military toppled Sudan's longtime president. But as, Eric, but as Derek Stoffel reports, they have since grown weary. There is defiance among the grief in Sudan. Just a day after more protesters were killed, as people continue to pressure the country's generals to hand over power, they buried their dead today. You can hear the gunshots ring out in this unverified video, sending protesters running for safety. The demonstrations yesterday were massive, called a millions march. We are worried, this protester says, for our children. We want them to live in peace. But there's been little calm, far from it, since government forces cracked down against the demonstrators. More than 100 people were killed in a massacre in which soldiers shot protesters and raped women in early June. All this began last December as Sudanese took to the streets, angry over the rising costs of bread and fuel. The movement grew and eventually brought down longtime President Omar al-Bashir in April. Celebrations at his ouster were short-lived, though, with the military seizing power. Now it's this man, General Mohammed Hamdan, in charge of a feared paramilitary group called the Rapid Support Forces, who runs the country. And while those forces have used brutal tactics, analysts say the demonstrators are unlikely to back down. These people are undaunted. I think most Sudanese feel that this is their chance. If they do not succeed now, they will not get another chance in their lifetimes. Protest organizers, though, have had a tough time spreading the word about upcoming demonstrations. After the government completely shut down the internet, they're now relying on word of mouth to encourage people to keep taking to the streets. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, London. Still ahead on The National, a made-in-Canada medical breakthrough. We, we revisit why the world's most expensive drug never made it to market. And it felt like Canada Day at Wimbledon, how the next generation is already leaving its mark. We connect with the fans uh, better than, than other players do, uh, I guess. And I think uh, we also feel the energy coming from the people at home. This Canada Day, we asked young people what they think makes this country special. I think Canada is special because, uh, because of all the different people that live here. It's a great place to live and there's great people here. People in Canada are very nice, very supportive of each other. They accept each other for who they are and accept each other's differences. My favorite part of Canada is the people and my friends. That people help each other. Everyone can just be themselves. It doesn't matter if you look different or you believe in different things, that everyone's welcome here. A couple of swallies and a good scoff. In Newfoundland, it means having a couple of drinks and a really good meal. If you're from another part of Canada, though, you might not know that, unless you had a copy of the new Newfoundland Dictionary. As Barbara Yappy reports, it's a helpful and a loving guide to Canada's most colorful English. Steam your tooth like on your ass. Doesn't the guy on the side of the day, you? 
Newfoundland English. It's a variety of dialects. Sometimes a delight and a dilemma. Fun to listen to, but hard to understand. Now there's help. The Dictionary of Newfoundland English. These English professors have spent the past 20 years gathering old Newfoundland words for their dictionary. They researched books and magazines and stories and songs. There are thousands of entries in the dictionary. Entries like nunny fudger. A good many Newfoundlanders might know what a nunny fudger is. It's a ninny. But who else would? George Story says there's a reason why Newfoundland speech is just a little different. You've got a comparatively few changes in the makeup of the Newfoundland people, the uh, ethnic stock or origin of 98% um, uh, of Newfoundlanders is um, Irish and uh, uh, West Country English, which means a high degree of homogeneity. George Earle reminds Newfoundlanders of their verbal heritage through his stories and poems. So when a youth goes all drudge to cross a mish to reach a rudge, he might be slinging for a spurt or seeking frankum, trout or hurt, or traipsing through a drug of vars, he perhaps is looking for his arse. 3,000 Newfoundland dictionaries were unloaded here recently, and even at $45 a copy, it looks like they'll be going fast. The response by the public has been nothing short of fantastic. It's the best thing since John Cabot, and we have sold in advance. 65% uh, of the 3,000. If you want to buy a dictionary and are living outside the province, you may have a tough time finding one. Very few copies went to the other provinces. Apparently, the publisher had a hard time convincing booksellers on the mainland that anyone would want to buy a dictionary of Newfoundland English. The champagne and pims are flowing at the All England Club. Wimbledon has begun. For tennis fanatics, summer isn't really here until the tournament begins on those beautiful grass courts. So far, the weather's been glorious, perfect for strawberries and cream. No need for the snazzy new retractable roof. The temperature is heating up, and so, of course, is the competition. So fans, like me, are excited to see the biggest tennis stars in the world. As Thomas Degla tells us, a growing number are Canadian. Could Canada steal the spotlight in the British sunshine? Have a great day. Throughout all of Wimbledon's storied history, never before has the tournament opened with three Canadians among the top 30. We we're one of the leading, leading countries now, um, which a, a little while ago would have been unheard of. First Jeannie Bouchard, then Milos Raonic reached the finals here. Both are back. But there's also a new name to watch. Of course, the young Felix is always a, a star to look at. Felix is your only team. I mean, Felix, 18 or something, is he? Yes, he is. 18 years old and fresh off two impressive performances in Europe, Montreal's Felix Auger Aliassim comes armed with a powerful serve and laser like focus. To be able to have a chance to compete in this historic tournament, it's, uh, it's really a dream come true. He considers himself one of the players leading Canada into the future. I think we connect with the fans uh, better than, than other players do, uh, I guess. And I think uh, we also feel the energy coming from the people at home. Astounding Andreescu. Who else? How about Bianca Andreescu, a rising star, though unable to play at Wimbledon due to injury. And then there's Denis Shapovalov, who shocked the world's number one, Novak Djokovic, with an exhibition win just last week. Well, I think it's a much bigger sport now. and I think Yes, it's a different Canada from the one Greg Rosetsky left to become Britain's top pro in the 90s. It wasn't mainstream. Hearing about a tennis player from Canada was a, was a rarity. Nowadays, it's the norm. It's great to have a group of them together around the same age group, pushing each other as well. How appropriate for Canada Day here at Wimbledon, an all-Canadian first-round match on day one with the newcomer, Felix Oji Aliasim, facing the veteran, Vashik Pospisil. <laughs> After overcoming early nerves, Oji Aliasim secured his 
first victory at a Grand Slam in four sets. Raonic also managed straight set success. Two Wimbledon wins and it's only just begun. Yes, it's been Canada's day indeed. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, London. Still ahead on the national, Canadians weren't the only young players stealing the show at Wimbledon today. And that is 15-year-old American Coco Gauff after she faced her idol and won. Her message to Venus Williams coming up in our moment. My name is Jordan Bennett. I'm uh, Migma from Dahomkuk, um, now known as Newfoundland. And I'm a visual artist. I work in a lot of mediums, including um, painting, sculpting, performance, and traditional indigenous tattoo revival. So a lot of times I create a work, and I might think that it might look great uh, as a painting. And then the next thing you know, I'm doing it as a sculpture or I'm doing it as a performance. I usually let the idea kind of do whatever it needs to do. So I have a couple pieces in the exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery as part of an insurgence resurgence. One of the pieces is a collaboration with fellow artist, indigenous artist Dee Barcy, and uh, we created each a painted mural element that exists in two places. Uh, one on a building on Broadway in Winnipeg, and the other version of it is a reproduction of that piece, uh, which is on the outside of the Winnipeg Art Gallery. A lot of the quill work that I'm referencing, I really enjoy putting them in the public view. I'm taking them out of a museum context, which is a lot of times where we see a lot of these pieces now. I was not expecting this. <laughs> I did not expect to walk into the room and see this piece. The first time I ever saw this piece was in a book wrote by uh, Ruth Holmes Whitehead. And seeing this, it's kind of like seeing a painting that you've loved your entire life. But then you see it in person and then it just kind of rattles your skull a little bit. I think the only way to learn more about these things is to actually spend time with them. Because I feel like the longer you spend time with something or someone or some place, the more you learn about it and the more you learn about them or yourself. So this piece is just next level. When I create an artwork that's larger than life, like cool work and I blow it up, it does confront you and it does um, make you question the history and uh, it's more in your face. A lot of times folks see them and they think that there are these, you know, contemporary art works in a sense, you know, like that's how they exist and that's all they are. But there is so much embedded history of the designs that are based on landscape, uh, stories and journeys that have taken place for hundreds and thousands of years um, on this land in Mi'kma'ki. Another piece that I'm a part of um, in the exhibition is alongside of um, fellow artists Amy Malboff and Dion Kaz is called Earthline Tattoo Collective. Uh, with the assistance of the Winnipeg Art Gallery, we uh, created a tattoo shop within the art gallery itself. And it's, it was a wonderful experience to share uh, methods of traditional indigenous tattooing through hand poke and skin stitch. I think that uh, the work that I'm trying to do is uh, a way of continuing and also a way of paying homage and honor to the artists and artisans that came before and allowed uh, these forms to exist in the world, you know, like they, they, they created them. And to be able to add to that dialogue using new materials like zip ties or through murals or through um, a variety of contemporary materials that I have access to, I think is um, a way of reawakening a lot of these designs that have been sleeping for a while.
It was a Canadian medical breakthrough called Glybera, a drug to treat a rare, often debilitating genetic disorder. And the team that developed it believed it could save lives, but it was also the most expensive drug in the world, and patients who want it can't get it. Kelly Crow shows us once again why a million-dollar medicine just could not make it to market. These are some of the last remaining vials of what was a life-changing drug, a made-in-Canada medical breakthrough called Glybera. It was the world's first gene therapy, the first drug on the market that could fix a faulty gene. It offered new hope for people who suffer from a rare and potentially deadly genetic disorder. It was a turning point in my life. Cynthia Turcott was born with a genetic mutation called lipoprotein lipase deficiency, or LPLD. Her blood becomes thick with fat particles, triggering painful and dangerous attacks of pancreatitis. There was no treatment before Glybera. But after just two years on the market, Glybera is gone. How did you feel about that? Disappointed, of course. I would like to have seen this go all the way and seen this uh, uh, bring benefit to patients everywhere in the world. But it didn't. This is the story of an unsung Canadian scientific achievement, a world first ultimately defeated by the harsh realities of the pharmaceutical industry. The Glybera story started more than 30 years ago in a publicly funded laboratory at the University of British Columbia. In the early days of gene research, Dr. Michael Hayden was a pioneer determined to find a cure for patients suffering unbearable abdominal pain. Each time going back to the patient and hearing their stories, you, that just keeps you going. You just have to go to a clinic and hear what the patient tells you about the episode of abdominal pain. They couldn't have a single normal meal in their lives. In a healthy person, the LPL protein breaks down dietary fat into small particles so it can be used to fuel the body's activities. But about three out of every million people are born with a defective LPL gene. The fat doesn't break down, and their blood becomes so thick, it turns white. So it comes out of the body looking like that? Yep. It does come out of the body, but you see it better if you have it standing in a fridge overnight. And then what sits on top looks like cream, white as cream and white as the fridge itself. John Castellan was a young doctor from Amsterdam when he first joined Hayden's team in the late 1980s. Hayden's first assignment for Castellan? To find the gene that makes the LPL protein. It wasn't going to be easy. At the time, the techniques for then finding the gene that belongs to the protein were in its infancy. It took two years, but they found it, using the DNA of a patient who had a severe mutation. We found, indeed, in a gene, a big fault. Actually, a hole. There was a whole hole in the gene. This was a very happy, happy uh, and a, special day, yeah. uh, and we knew we had something. A good day. Their eureka moment was captured in this photograph. Everybody was uh, really thrilled, thrilled. We knew we had it at that moment. Now that they'd found the defective gene, could they fix it? I have to give all the credit to Michael. He started to think about gene therapy. We know they've got a defective gene, the one way to treat this would be to replace the gene. I mean, it was a fairly simple concept, but the problem is how do you deliver that gene and how do you get it into the blood? They decided to use a harmless virus, specially designed to deliver the new gene into the body. The first tests yeah. were in mice. The stunning results made the cover of this medical journal, showing how day by day, the white, fat-laden blood turned red. That was an amazing moment, and you just saw it. You, when you withdrew blood, in the first, it's like milk. And then you take it a week later, it's lighter. You take it a week later, it's lighter. You take it eight weeks later, and it's completely clear. We've got it. You've, you, you knew you had it then. Then, through sheer luck, the UBC team found the same genetic mutation in a colony of cats from New Zealand. When the drug cured the cats, it was time to test it on humans. But that takes lots of money. 
It's called the Valley of Death. That moment when a scientific discovery makes the treacherous journey from the lab to the marketplace. That's when the investors, the business experts, and the marketing specialists step in to pay for clinical trials, manufacturing, and licensing costs. It's the only way a scientific discovery ever gets to patients because universities don't make drugs. So Castellan returned to Amsterdam and formed a drug company to develop the treatment that would be called Glybira. So we took over all the science, the mice science, the cat science, the virus science. Back in Vancouver, Hayden's team continued to provide lab support for the Dutch company. And in Holland, the first clinical trials were an immediate success. Within an hour, all the patients could walk and they never had any side effects at all from the therapy. But to get government approval, they needed more human trials. So they returned to the one place in the world with the highest prevalence of the disease, and that's here in Canada, along Quebec's Saguenay River. At a special lipid clinic in Chicoutimi, doctors began testing Glybera on LPLD patients who live in the area, where a gene mutation from a single ancestor has been passed down through the generations. Cynthia Turcott's parents both carried the mutation, but they didn't know it until their infant daughter almost died. I was um, eight months old and uh, I had um, some pain and I was vomiting and my mother was very panicking. We saw that on, in the blood sample there was some part was uh, white, like cream, and was like, oh, and they panicked. They said to my mother, I had 24 hours to live. The doctors saved her life by starving her until her fat levels dropped. But she was told she could never eat chocolate or ice cream or hot dogs or milk and forget about beer or wine and a normal social life. The worst part was when she was told she could never have children. I was uh, in shock. I was grieving. I had to go to, to uh, I'm a psychologist, I had to go to, uh, to psychotherapy to, to deal with it. Then at 22, she was stricken with a dreaded attack of pancreatitis. When she heard about the clinical trials happening in Shikudami, Turcotte immediately volunteered. So I, I said, yeah, I want to go there, I want to have it. Turcotte had no way of knowing then that she would be one of the few patients in the world ever to receive the life-changing drug. Back in Amsterdam, the drug company spent years trying to convince Europe's health regulators to approve it. And there was a lot of fighting and the politics, very unpleasant. Over the years it took to win that approval, the company lost millions. It was liquidated. A new company took over, called Unicure. It partnered with an Italian firm to finally get Glybera on the market. When the drug went on sale, it made headlines because not only was it the world's first gene therapy, it had also become the world's most expensive drug. The price, around $1 million for the one-time treatment. Did they tell you how much they were going to charge? No, no, I learned that first from, from he reading about it uh, as it became public. No, I, I did not know what they were gonna charge. Back in Vancouver, Hayden was not involved with the new company. He and UBC had signed over their patents long ago and moved on to other research. Hayden would get no money from the sale of Glybera, and he had nothing to do with setting the price. To be quite frank, this was not something I was particularly proud of, uh, that the pricing of this made this out of the reach of patient, the very patients, and the whole motivation for doing this was to have this available for patients. The problem is, is also that people like me and Michael, we never have anything to say about pricing. You know, by the time that there's a pricing, we are, we are gone already because it, we, we've done the science and the clinical work and everything. And then it's the commercial and the financial people who determine the price. Why did Glybera cost so much? A Unicure official told us the million dollar price was based on a business calculation because other drugs for rare diseases can cost several hundred thousand dollars a year, every year, for life. 
By comparison, Glybera, with a one-time cost of a million dollars, seemed reasonable, especially since it was the only drug that could treat LPLD. And for that price, uh, obviously, it was almost impossible to sell it. In the end, there was only one customer. A German doctor prescribed it for this woman. It changed her life and stopped the potentially deadly pancreatitis attacks. With no other customers, Glybera was abandoned. Three remaining doses were given away for the bargain price of one euro each. Added up, the drug was given to only 31 people in the entire world, most treated free in the clinical trials. Cynthia Turcott is thrilled to be one of them. Because of Glybera, she was able to have two healthy children. Unicure officials told us there are no plans to revive Glybera or to apply for license in the U.S. or Canada. I have a hard time understanding why you're not angry that this drug that you developed didn't get used. I think I was angry at the time, but because this has taken so long, um, it kind of wears you out in a way. For the scientists, the discovery of Glybera is still a career highlight, an historic Canadian achievement that beat the odds. It did work, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so the patients that got it are still very happy. But in the harsh reality of the drug business, that's not enough. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. Incredible. Still ahead on The National, one small step for man and one giant payday for a former NASA intern. We'll explain that one, but first, a preview of something you will see in the coming days on The National. Southern resident killer whales are endangered and closely watched, but right now they are missing in action. Friar Stewart looks at what's being done to track them. This team of U.S. government scientists is tagging Chinook, but this is not just about the salmon. That's because the salmon are the main prey for the endangered southern resident killer whales. These orcas only hunt for fish. Certainly there's been a tremendous interest in the United States and in Canada as well in uh, the plight of the southern resident killer whales. And I think it really has raised awareness of what might be happening out in the ocean. I'll tell you about it. punk rock. Punk okay. rock is a word used by dilettantes. Okay. And, uh, and uh, heartless manipulators about music that takes up the energies and the bodies and the hearts and the souls and the time and the minds of young men who give what they have to it and give everything they have to it. And it's a, it's a term that's based on contempt. It's a term that's based in fashion, style, elitism, Satanism, and everything that's rotten about rock and roll. The, the way I don't know Johnny Rotten, but, <laughs> yeah. but I'm, sure, I'm sure he puts as much blood and sweat into what he does as Sigmund Freud did. Johnny Rotten does. <laughs> what I can't figure is whether you're you're acting against that label. You don't like the label. I'm not acting. No, I know. Reacting against the label then. Respond responding angrily to the label. You don't like the label. Is that right? I don't like to hear it come out of someone's mouth. Okay. Where do you like to hear it come out of? <laughs> Listen, tell me seriously, I have, I have never seen you perform, but I have read reviews about vomiting on the stage, about sticking pencils in your flesh, about bleeding lips, and about all those things. I want to know the purpose behind that. I, I... Uh, the, the purpose or the reason? The purpose or the reason? I vomited, I was ill. I'm not sorry I was ill. Uh, everyone gets ill sometimes, and uh, I was ill one evening, and... As I felt that I was going to vomit anyway, I decided I may as well do it uh, with some style. So I did it something like this. <laughs> Actually, the, the Prime Minister of Canada... I've never stuck in... a pencil in my flesh. It, 
Is that these, right? These come, this, these come mostly from my fingernails. But you do, you do mutilate and scratch yourself, do you, on the stage? These are innocent questions. I have not seen you perform. I've just read a great deal about you. Uh, and I want to know why. <laughs> uh, why? Because what sounds to you like a big load of trashy old noise is, in fact, the brilliant music of a genius, myself. And that music is so powerful that it's quite beyond my control. And uh, when I'm in the grips of it, I don't feel pleasure and I don't feel pain, either physically or emotionally. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. Have, you ever, have you ever felt like that? When you just, when you just, you couldn't feel anything and you didn't want to either, <laughs> you know? Like that. Some. Critics. You understand what I'm saying, sir? I am trying. You don't have to call me, sir. No, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. After another escalation, we look at how heavy sanctions against Iran are affecting regular Iranians and analyze the strategy of the United States. You can subscribe to Front Burner wherever you get your podcasts. Oh my God, dude, seriously, you do this, dude. Well, those wild pictures are from Mexico, and that truck is plowing through the remnants of a freak hailstorm in Guadalajara. A blanket of ice pellets a meter deep, partially buried vehicles, and damaged hundreds of homes. Still, that sheet of ice brought some relief in the summer heat that is normally around 30 degrees this time of year. And a terrible discovery in South London, England. A body of an unidentified man was found in a residential garden. Investigators believe he was a stowaway who fell from a plane en route to Heathrow. A bag and supplies were found inside the landing compartment of a flight from Nairobi. At least two men have died in similar circumstances since 2012. And Japan has resumed commercial whale hunting after a break of more than three decades. Hunters killed at least two minke whales today. The country delayed announcing its catch quota, now set at 227 whales for the year, until after this weekend's G20 in Osaka. Critics say demand for whale meat has vanished and the industry only survives because of millions in subsidies. <laughs> And there she is, Canada's chef de mission for the 2020 Tokyo Summer Games, announced today at the Canada Day party in Ottawa. Rower Marnie McBean is a three-time Olympic gold medalist and officer of the Order of Canada. Her new role is to act as Team Canada spokesperson and to mentor the athletes and coaches. On this Canada Day, far from the nation's capital, people were celebrating from coast to coast to coast with lots of smiles and sunshine for most. There were big cheers in Vancouver for this laid-back parade starring salmon on the grill. Plenty of flag waving in Edmonton, some of it quite inventive. Not that it's a contest or anything. I like cheese! And in Toronto, you could choose a parade or board an iconic schooner on the shores of Lake Ontario. We've been singing all day, lots of dancing, lots of kids and great sunshine, so it's been a great day and happy Canada Day. Not quite so much sunshine in Halifax, but people still turned out to mark the day together. But even as the party brings us together, some can be made to feel they don't belong. It happens when someone asks the question, where do you come from? Usually I'll just start with, well, I'm Canadian, but depending on who's asking it, I know what they're actually asking me. So if it's a white person, I know they're actually asking like, um, you know, tell me about your brown skin. I get asked that question all the time. Where are you from? It's about how do I place you? 
Um, how do you come to belong here? Do you belong here? So all those things are sort of at the back of this question. Hey everybody, my name is Christy Charles. I'm from Musqueam and I live in this place called Vancouver. And in our indigenous communities, it's kind of like a, a fun thing we say to like, oh, hey, where are you from? Who's your mom? But then when I'm talking to people in the city, they don't know that I come from here, right? And this is our, our, our home for thousands of years. So when someone says to me, oh, I'm from Vancouver, I'm like, well, where are you really from? Because I'm really from Vancouver, yeah. The question speaks to the limits um, of Canadian multiculturalism. There's the rhetoric of it, a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. There's a Canadian mosaic of cultures and races that make up Canada. And then there's the reality. The expectation is that real Canadians are white Canadians. Where, where's your ethnic background? Actually, I go out of my way to ask that question to white people to kind of reaffirm that we're actually not really from here. There's a kind of tokenization to the idea of indigeneity being one of the founding peoples of, of Canada. Because I think it's really ironic for Canada to be so very open about bringing other people into land that is in fact other people's land. I could take it in a negative way because it does frustrate me sometimes always having to repeat myself. It's a heavy thing to ask depending on how far the other person is pushing you to answer it and how deep they want you to answer it. It can take a toll on you for sure. I think people can ask it as a benign question, as just, I'm curious. They literally mean where you're from because you don't sound like you're from here or you're, you don't look like you're from here. So you don't mean it in a bad way, but its effect is to tell that person, you don't belong here, or you might not belong here. We have to get to a point where that question becomes unnecessary. Up next on The National, a dream-like debut at Wimbledon for one young player. I was just saying, telling her that she's so inspiring and um, like I, I always wanted to tell her that. Coco Goff's message to Venus Williams after she beat her is our moment, but first. We have In case you missed it, NASA's original video recordings of the first moon landing are going up for auction and they could fetch a couple million dollars. Take a look. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. No, NASA isn't looking to cash in. NASA doesn't even own these tapes. You see, decades ago, the space agency accidentally sold them to an intern in a big load of cast-off tapes for $217. But even he didn't understand their value. Gary George then sold eight reels to TV stations for 50 bucks each, not for their content, but to record over them. NASA was so wrapped up in the live broadcast back then, no one gave a moment's thought to the archives. It was eventually George's dad who noticed three tapes of the moon landing and just thought they might be worth saving. The Sotheby's auction house thinks this is the time to sell with the 50th anniversary just weeks away. NASA just reopened the Apollo Mission Control Center in Houston, having restored it to look almost exactly as it did on the day that humanity gained a foothold in the heavens. Wayne Gretzky, the most valuable player in professional hockey. When you play hockey, you play for fun. I think uh, right now I play it because I have fun and I enjoy it. I continue to, to play until it comes a time when I consider it a job. And I think when you consider it a job, I think that's when you should retire. And I remember my first game of pro, I thought, you know, I finally made it, I'm going to make the most of it. And I, I think I try to play every game as hard as I can. And uh, I'm going to make the most of it while I'm there because it's just tremendous life. Some are born to play hockey. People were telling me that I could make the NHL and, and I wanted to prove that I could, but I always had this feeling that, you know, maybe if I don't work hard enough that I wouldn't make it. So I always tried to do the best I could. 
many kids want to play in the NHL, but you know, you can only do one thing and you can't do so many other things. And I think you have to put your priorities first. Uh, if you want to be a hockey player, that's what you got to practice. And if you can do that, then, then you'll get there. Hi, Tammy. Hi, Trevor. Hi. Today we're here to learn some real basics of hockey. Okay. All right. Let's okay. start off with some easy stick handling drills with no pucks, just stick in the air, and we'll just practice turning our wrists over like this. Pretend you have a puck in the air, and just nice and easy. Is that okay? Just keep rolling your wrist, that's good. Now we'll try it on the ice, okay? All right. Just bring it over easy, and then bring it back. Just make sure you're always turning your wrist with it all the time. If you keep moving those wrists, it makes it that much simpler. Okay, I'll try it with a couple of pucks, how's that? Okay. Okay, all you have to do is the puck in between you, right in between the middle of your skates. Okay? Put the puck in the middle of your hockey stick and just over easy and back Am I easy. doing it right? That's it. That's good. Just bring it over easy and then back. Over and back. Now try to keep your head up while you're doing it and pick a spot. Just look at that and see if you can stick handle with that. If you don't okay. keep your head up, you get knocked over pretty easy, mm -hmm. so you gotta be able to do that. That's it. You guys learn pretty quick. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Moving on to our next show, we'll go into some passing and taking a pass. Okay. First of all, we'll start off with giving a pass. All you have to do really is remember the same as the stick handling. Always keep your stick cupped over like this all the time. Put the puck right in the middle of your skates, facing that direction if you're going to pass there. Always remember to stay on an angle. All you do is you bring it back nice and slow, just like your stick handle. Keep your stick cupped like this. Watch where you're going to pass and bring it right through. There's no slapping involved, and you just shovel it, sort of, and it's right through. Okay, okay. Tammy, let's see you try it. There you go. Put it right in between your skates. <clears throat> Pull it back. Nice and easy. That's it. And right through. There you go. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to our next little drill, we'll learn how to take a pass. It's the same as giving a pass to stick handling. Always remember to cup that stick, just okay. like that. Okay. Remember to curl your wrists, and just as the puck's coming, just bring your stick back a little bit and catch it. That's all there is to it. Put okay. your stick right in between your legs, and just as it's going to get there, bring your stick back, just like that, nice and slow. OK, we'll try it a few times right here. OK? Yep. Bring your stick back and catch it. Make sure you turn your wrist, pull it back. That's it. Our last drill, we'll try to combine everything that we've done into one drill. Some stick handling, taking a pass, giving a pass, and eventually put the puck in the net. Okay, Tammy, you give it a try first. Just remember, okay. bring that stick back and catch the puck nice and easy. There you go. Take it in. Roll your wrist. Turn the stick. Put it in. There All you right. go. Okay, Trevor, give it a shot. You guys keep working on that stuff, and you get better at it the more you practice it. Yeah, thanks. That was really fun. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> It's not every day a teenager can take down one of sport's most decorated athletes, but that is exactly what happened at Wimbledon today. Venus Williams was upset by a 15-year-old. American Corey Goff, who goes by Coco, knew she was going up against her tennis idol, the player who'd inspired her to pick up a racket in the first place. Well, today, Williams wound up passing the torch. Their matchup is our moment. Um, she just told me that uh, congratulations and to keep going and good luck. Um, after a match, I told her that just thank you for everything she did. Um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Um, and I was just saying, telling her that she's so inspiring and um, like I, I always wanted to tell her that. And I, even though I met her before, I guess now I had the guts to. Um, I don't even know what my parents would be saying. I know they're super happy. My dad uh, was just jumping up every time I won a point. I just, I never thought this would happen. I'm literally living my dream right now and uh not many people get to say that so i'm just happy that um Wimbledon gave me the opportunity just to play and i obviously never thought that it, w I w it would be this far yeah she did everything well today I and mean, she she put the ball in the court which was much better than i did and um serve well move well it was it was a great match for her yeah just well done and good luck you know i mean the sky's the limit it really is 
Oh, sky's totally the limit for her. Some perspective here. Five days ago, Coco was writing her high school science exam. And Venus Williams, this is only the second time since she debuted in 1997 that she's been beaten in the first round. How's that for a day at the office? That is a national for July the 1st. Good night, everybody. Tonight, celebrating Canada's big day. The party turns political on Parliament Hill. We can and we must continue to make our country even better. So how are Canadians really feeling as the election looms? <laughs> Crisis in oh, yeah. Hong Kong as activists storm the legislature. How a day of peaceful protest ended in violence. She can't believe it. I'm literally living my dream right now. And the Wimbledon rookie who upset Venus Williams, and she's only 15. The teens who are owning the court, including a Canadian. This is The National.